If you could take the genes from the consummate military leader and combine them with the genes of the consummate fighter pilot, the result might look just like this. However, if you created a fictional military hero with Brigadier General Robin Ohl's resume, an editor would likely reject it for being beyond believable. In 1942, Ohl's was an All-American tackle for West Point. In 1943, he was commissioned a second lieutenant and completed pilot training. He entered World War II flying a P-38 he named SCAT-1. As he progressed through different iterations of fighter planes, he simply kept adding Roman numerals to the SCAT name. He finished the war in a P-51 named SCAT-7. In addition to becoming a double ace plus with 12 aerial victories, he destroyed another 11 and one half aircraft on the ground. He later became the wingman on the Air Force's first aerobatic jet team. In 1966, he became commander of the 8th Tactical Fighter Wing at Ubon Royal Thai Air Force Base, Thailand. Robin Olds flew 152 combat missions in Southeast Asia in F-4 Phantoms, 105 of them over North Vietnam. He shot down two North Vietnamese MiG-17s and two MiG-21s. Robin Oles was famous for something else. He never learned to mince words or play politics with the mission of the military, as those in the Warbirds in Review audience learned when Oles described his return from Vietnam. Uh, I got home about the 20 or the last day of September, 1st of October, on a Friday. My family in Washington. I'm on leave. Phone rang Saturday. Then get over here to the Pentagon. Chief of Staff wants to see you Monday morning. I said, I'm on leave. He said, it doesn't matter. The chief wants to see you. I said, yes, sir. Okay. I reported into his office. He's the one that walked up to me and said, take off that mustache. Said, yes, sir. <laughs> the next thing I knew, he briefed me, and I'm in the Oval Office of the White House. You know, I. God, me? <laughs> LBJ was the president. So I'm sitting on the end of a couch. He's on an easy chair. And his aide, a colonel, Air Force colonel, was sitting on my right. And Mr. President said, uh, uh, welcome home, colonel. Uh, you, you did well. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah, well, uh, what's it like to be home? That was the weekend that thousands and thousands of hippies marched on the Pentagon. I said, sir, uh, who are all those funny-looking people that marched on the Pentagon yesterday? He, and I'm going to quote for you folks. He said, I got 240,000 boys over there in Vietnam. When those boys come home, they'll tell the American public what's happening. And I thought, wait a minute. Not me. That's your job, not mine. But of course, you don't say that. So the best thing I could think of to come up with, I said, sir, I've been home since Friday. Been to a couple of dinner parties. No one asked me where I've been or what I've been doing for the past year. In case somebody does ask, what would you like me to tell them? I'm thinking, you know, end a career. <laughs> he glared at me and then he said, well, Colonel, you tell them, I'm quoting, that we are preventing the North Vietnamese from interfering in the democratic process in South Vietnam. I said, I'm sorry, sir, I can't say that. Well, why not, Colonel? Well, sir, if that's why we're there, I don't want to be the one that spreads the word. It was grim for a few minutes, but I hand the man full credit. He, he let me talk. He listened. And he sent me down the next morning to talk to his chief security advisor in the basement of the White House. We argued for a couple of hours. But this security advisor and I argued, at one point I said something, he said, you know we can't do that, that'll bring down the Chinese. I said, the Chinese and the North Vietnamese have hated each other for a couple of thousand years. 
They fought wars against each other. Haven't you read their history? No, he hadn't. So finally he said, what do you think we ought to do? And I said, for God's sakes, sir, mine the harbors, because everything they used came in by ship bottom. Gas, you know, missiles, ammunition, everything, food. His response when I said mine the harbors was, we can't do that. That's an act of war. And mind you, this was the about the second or third of October of 1967. I wonder if he ever wondered what the hell we were doing over there. Now it was, uh, I maintain we had every reason to be there, but we went about it improperly under the leadership of McNamara and Johnson. Sadly, Robin Olds passed away on June 14th, 2007. Across the Black River, the Red River, down the mountain chains to your target. So for the pre-strike, we went up. I said, Orange 5-6, this is uh, Lincoln lead, tally -ho. And this guy said, Lincoln, take the perch. And I said, what? He said, take the perch. Let me tell you what that told me. It told me this was a new guy from the States, probably his first mission, obviously out of sack, following the rules. And I said, son, we don't take a perch around here. Just hold still. <laughs> we'll be right there. What I didn't tell him <laughs> was when we came up behind the tanker, each of us in F-4s are taking turns. It was in safe, but we're making sure that the growl of the sidewinder coincides with the sight picture, and you're doing the sight picture is his engines. <laughs> he didn't know that. So we refueled, and that's, everything's fine. Everything's fine. But I stayed in a bit too long. Got in a fight with with a bunch of MIGs, and I'm tapping the burners. Pretty soon I looked at the fuel gauge, and we are way below what we should have been. We had three bingos. Bingo. Hard bingo means you better get back to the, and then a, I can't say the word, but bingo. <laughs> Which meant you better get to the tanker or you're in deep trouble. So I thought, Robin, you have really climbed deep in North 6, which we never usually went out low. Fortunately, no Sams. I called him, hey, Orange 5 6, head north. He says, Lincoln, I got a check with Brigham, ground. I said, Brigham is busy, head north. I'll work the intercept, you know, with the radar on the F 4. Well, finally, here he came, and I'm looking at my fuel gauge, and it's like this. My other three guys were low, but I was the worst. So I, we got the tanker, I turned him, plugged him, I relief, they, they finished. Now I came up for my full offload. Plugged in, he pulled the boom and stowed it. This is one of, one of those big tanker birds. And I said, hey, give me some fuel. <coughs> This pilot said, no, we're bingo, RTB, meaning he was low on his fuel, returning to base, RTB. I said, wait a minute. I'm going to have to bail out of this airplane in just a minute or two. Give me some fuel. No, nope, we're bingo. And I said, I knew from reading his um, you know, method of operation, he could fly from where we were over northern Laos all the way to the south of Thailand, turn left and go to the Pacific, I mean, to go to the Philippines and loiter for 20 minutes. That was his bingo. And my fuel gauge is like this. So finally I said, okay. I got one sidewinder left. <laughs> uh, I'm going to drop back about 2,000 feet and before I put the ejection handle, I'm going to pull the trigger, so put your parachutes on. Boy, that boom came down. 
I plugged in. He started fueling me. My left engine quit. That's how low I was. I managed to hang on and get it started. He said, how much do you want? I said, fill it up. <laughs> Which I didn't want because couldn't land with that much fuel. So I did a dirty trick, got my offload, I pulled right up in front of him about a thousand feet and hit the jettison switch. And got, it, got rid of half of that fuel. I said, you might need it. <laughs> I said, sir, the MiGs are getting awful frisky, as you know. Uh, I have an idea of something we can do about it. He just grunted. And I said, oh, well, end of that. But five days later, I'm in his office. He said, okay, what's your idea? I said, sir, I want to plan a mission where I'll take my F-4s up there and we look like 105s, because the MiGs love to tangle with the 105s. So we plan and plan and plan and plan and pulled this mission off on the 2nd of January. Now the F-4, if you may have noticed, not in afterburner, but in full mill, leaves smoke trails. One factor. Two, a friend of mine named Donovan F. Smith in 7th Air Force said, Robin, I'm gonna send you QRC 190s. Like you, what the hell is that? It's an ECM pod, a jamming e emitter against their SAM sites, which the, which the 105s had carried, but we never had. So there's, there's a bit of deception. And then Mother Nature got in the act. Morning. You, <laughs> morning. Mother Nature got in the act and gave us a nice undercast so they couldn't see the smoke trails. So we did all this stuff, went down right over Fukien, nothing. Turned around just north of Hanoi, came back. My backseater says, I got one. Oops, went underneath. So I turned around, came back. Then here arrived my second flight. And the first transmission was, <laughs> a lead, you got a MiG-21 on your ass. <laughs> what a way to start a fight. But they all popped up through the, through the clouds. They thought we were 105s, but nuh uh. We were loaded for bear. And we, we got seven of them. Found out I heard a transmission of their, of their radio chatter. The lead says, <coughs> whatever the ground said, hey, these aren't 105s, these are phantoms. What do we do? Well, there was great confusion. In the meantime, we're bang, bang, bang. <laughs> that was fun. Yeah. Another another leading question your your interview with President Johnson. You're coming back to the States and Do I have President, to? Do I have to? No, sir, you don't have to. Well then I will. <laughs> uh we're talking about uh, Vietnam obviously. Uh I got home about the twenty or the last day of September, first of October. On a Friday, my family in Washington, and I'm on leave. Phone rang Saturday. Said, "Get over here to the Pentagon. Chief of Staff wants to see you Monday morning." I said, "I'm on leave." He said, it "Doesn't matter. The chief wants to see you." I said, "Yes, sir. Okay." I reported into his office. He's the one that walked up to me and said, "Take off that mustache." Yes, sir. <laughs> the next thing I knew, he briefed me, and I'm in the Oval Office of the White House. <coughs> you know, I... God, me? <laughs> LBJ was the president. So I'm sitting on the end of a couch. He's on an easy chair, and his aide, a colonel, Air Force colonel, was sitting on my right. And Mr. President said, uh, uh, Welcome home, Colonel. Uh, you, you did well. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah, well, uh, what's it like to be home? That was the weekend that thousands and thousands of hippies marched on the Pentagon. 
And I said, sir, um, and my daughter, Chris, had told me what hippies were. <laughs> I said, sir, uh, who are all those funny looking people that marched on the Pentagon yesterday? He, and I'm gonna quote for you folks. He said, I got 240,000 boys over there in Vietnam. When those boys come home, they'll tell the American public what's happening. And I thought, wait a minute. Huh? That's your job, not mine. Well, of course, you don't say that. So the best thing I could think of to come up with, uh, said, sir, I've been home since Friday. Been to a couple of dinner parties. No one asked me where I've been or what I've been doing for the past year. In case somebody does ask, what would you like me to tell them? I'm thinking, you know, end of career. <laughs> he glared at me and then he said, well, Colonel, you tell them, I'm quoting, that we are preventing the North Vietnamese from interfering in the democratic process in South Vietnam. I said, I'm sorry, sir, I can't say that. Well, why not, Colonel? Well, sir, if that's why we're there, I don't want to be the one that spreads the word. Ooh. It was grim for a few minutes, but I hand the man full credit. He, he let me talk. He listened. And he sent me down the next morning to talk to his chief security advisor in the basement of the Pentagon, of, of the White House. And we argued for a couple of hours. Uh, How come he gets to fly it and I don't? <laughs> but this security advisor and I argued, at one point I said something, he said, you know we can't do that, that'll bring down the Chinese. I said, the Chinese and the North Vietnamese have hated each other for a couple of thousand years. They fought wars against each other. Haven't you read their history? No, he hadn't. So finally he said, what do you think we ought to do? And I said, for God's sakes, sir, mine the harbors, because everything they use came in by ship bottom. Gas, you know, missiles, ammunition, everything, food. His response when I said mine the harbors was, we can't do that, that's an act of war. <laughs> and mind you, this was the about the 2nd or 3rd of October of 1967. I wonder if he ever wondered what the hell we were doing over there. Now it was, uh, I maintain we had every reason to be there, but we went about it improperly under the leadership of McNamara and Johnson. Here, here. Yeah. Hi, this is uh, Marius Maxwell, Dr. Marius Maxwell. This is his airplane. This is actually the first time he's seen it in this paint job. And uh, it's beautiful. It's, beautiful. It's, job, yeah. it's absolutely beautiful. This is you want to tell us, owns that, that tell us a little bit about this particular airplane? Oh, well, I, I really would just defer to Robin Oles. I agree with everything he says always. Uh, it's a lovely airplane, uh, 1947 uh, P-51. And uh, it's SCAT-6 now and henceforth, and that's about all there is to say. Thank you. We'll open it up for questions if, uh, do you have anything else you'd like to say before we open up for questions, General? I think I've already said too much. No, sir, you never say too much. Anybody got a question? Yo! Thank you. I may have missed it in the introduction. What was your involvement in Korea? Obviously you were in World War II, got 13 kills, Nam, four more or more. What were you up to in Korea? Thank you. I had a squadron of 86s. They're drawing pilots from us. My name headed every list, turned down every time. I never knew why I blamed a colonel that I worked for. It took me 20 years to find out. <coughs> My wife then was doing a television show in New York City. 
I mean, she was an actress. Her mother. The backer was a very powerful, wealthy man whose friend was the secretary of the Air Force. The backer told the secretary, don't let him go. It took me 20 years to find that out. And I don't think you knew that, Chris. Uh, yes, sir. Where? Somebody else of the P-38 pilot. They put uh, aileron boost on the airplane later, but we never had it. But it would roll just as fast as you had to roll it under whatever circumstance. Matter of fact, I prided myself of being a pretty good P-38 pilot. I could whip a P-51 down low. You know. Oh, a story about, this is kind of amusing to me. Somebody, people often ask me, say, wasn't it wonderful to fly a P-38 with those two engines? And I said, boy, it sure was. I came home five times on single engine, all shot up. Love that bird. But you know the strangest thing? I flew another tour in P-51s. I came home single engine every day. <laughs> yeah. General, you've had a, an incredible career uh, flying a variety of different aircraft. What was your favorite aircraft that you flew over the years? Uh, well, I have, to, I have to add the F-4, but the many years in between. I love that bird. General Olds, just a quick question. In World War II, was your more feared adversary the 109 or the 190? I didn't fear either one of them. <laughs> well, what was your preferred? Don't get out in front of me. No, sir, I know you're asking a serious question, but, you know, in, in combat, you don't have time for that kind of analysis. You're fighting another human being, which you don't think about, another machine. And you try to anticipate what's he going to do next, which way is he going to go. So in a big fight, there's danger from being shot at. There's danger from collisions. Okay? Those are the two worst, as you know. You try to get your people to fight as a team, but it doesn't work. You're lucky if your wingman can hold on. It takes an extraordinary wingman to follow the violent maneuvers, and pretty soon you do get split up. And in War Two, we got split up almost every fight. You go home with one or two, or one. I never saw a 110 or, a, you know, a 410, except on the ground. Next question. I'm very. Uh, when you're engaged, do you ever watch the controls of the other airplane aircraft that you're engaged with? I, it's, uh, that's how dumb I am. Okay. Answer: No. Uh, technically, maybe too far away, but um, combat-wise. You're anticipating his move, depending upon your relative position. I mean, if he's behind you, you can't see. <laughs> you don't want that. If he's out here in a turn, God, if he turns back that way and you're trying to turn inside him, if he goes like that, you got him. So then it's who can turn the tightest, okay? So you, you don't really think that way. You know what he has to do. Well, it's like one day going in, uh, oh, I might, you mind if I make a story out of this? No, sir. I was commanding the 81st Tact Fighter Wing in England. Been there a year and a half, been a colonel for a long time. Phone rang, somebody from Washington. Almost whispered, you're on the list, meaning I was going to be a general. This is 65. I didn't want to be a general. I wanted to go to Southeast Asia. I miss Korea. I'm going to go to Southeast Asia. What can I do? I can't tell the Air Force I don't want to be a general. They'll say, okay, fine, get out. 
I know. I'm going to make that boss of mine so mad, he'll take me off the list, he'll want to court-martial me, then I can go to South Detail. So I got three guys. We put on a formation acrobatic demonstration in F-101Cs. That's a single seat bird. <laughs> Sorry, excuse for wings. <coughs> but I had done that sort of thing on the fir very first uh, jet acrobatic team back in 46. I was wingman. So I kind of knew what I was doing. <laughs> we put on a wonderful show. Bomb burst the whole nine yards. Well, my boss heard about it. I bet his missile badge burned him. So Got I had call down to London, chewed out, tore up my Legion of Merit. My effectiveness report was all wrong. <laughs> he waved a piece of paper in my face and said, and this says you'll never be a general. And I thought, oh, now we're getting somewhere. <laughs> And he chewed and chewed and waggled his waddles at me. And finally, in the most disgusting voice, he said, and you are the kind of Air Force officer that ought to be in Southeast Asia. And I jumped up out of the chair and said, yes, sir, thank you very much, General. About face and left, and he's still shouting at me. <laughs> Got one more question so, over here, wait, Robin. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, you're not you, done. Told you it would be a long one. <laughs> so we're going up the Gulf of Tonkin one day. I've got a backseater named Steve Croker. Turned inbound at Kep, headed for the Northeast Railroad. We got hit by about 16 MiGs. There were eight of us. Roundy round, longest dogfight I was ever in. Got one early. Lead was doing figure eights down. I could see him down below us. So I told everybody, get out, RTB, you know, bingo. Made a circle to see if my guys got out. Then I left, and I thought about that guy. I said, nope, going back in. Went back in, about 25 feet, and there he is. Headed for his base, but there's a little range of hills. And I told the backseater, I said, Stevie, you watch him, he's got Three choices. He can bail out, he can hit that ridge, or he can get over the ridge and give me some airspace and I'll get a sidewinder. He chose the ladder, sidewinder, boom, down he went. I plugged into that tanker with 300 pounds of fuel left. Oh, now that was a disconnected story because I forgot why I was gonna tell you about that goddamn general. <laughs> Sam, this uh, this gentleman's been patiently waiting over here. Over here, Sam, to your right. Oh, okay. First of all, I want to thank you for the service you give to our country. And uh, and I've always wondered uh, about the 51 versus the ME109. Could he outturn you, or could you outturn him in a dogfight? Good. I hope you all heard the question. I wish I could answer that question. I honestly think it depended upon the pilot in the cockpit. The birds were fairly equal. As no. Well, see, he, I mean, he died in France flying as a reconnaissance 38. Yeah, yeah. He worked for a friend of mine. <laughs> I'm sorry, what, what was the question? General, please finish the story about the goddamn general. <laughs> it was a couple of years after the after that encounter and uh, I'm now a commandant of cadets at the Air Force Academy with a baby star up here one and I'm talking to my old boss four-star general Spike Moemeyer who was seventh Air Force commander in Saigon another friend three stars then he was then commanding a training command George Simler, both of those gentlemen, of course, had spent their time in Southeast Asia. So while we were talking, here came the general from London that had chewed me on, waddling across the floor. 
And I said, excuse me, sir, excuse me, sir. Now, I know that both of these gentlemen had read my derogatory file because it's rather thick and good reading. <laughs> and excuse me, sir, excuse me. Oh, General Hardy, how nice to see you again, sir. You remember that magnificent chewing out you gave me there in Rye Slip back in 1965? Oh, yes, sir. These, these two, four-star, three-star, are kind of listening. I said, sir, you told me something that day that I've always wondered about. You said I was the kind of Air Force officer that ought to be in Southeast Asia. And I've wondered ever since, in your estimation, what kind of Air Force officer should not be in Southeast Asia. <laughs> I thought Simler was going to fall on the floor laughing. And even Momeyer laughed, which I'd never heard before. <laughs> As General Hardy whirled about, red-faced, walked away, I reached between these two gentlemen and said, gotcha! <laughs> All right, folks, thank you for coming, and please stand up and give this true American hero a, a, a hand here. I took a hit through the hinge on this door. And the door flew back like a flap. And I wonder why won't the airplane go, you know? And I'm dragging this thing just like a big flap. I got as far as Brussels, landed, saw what was wrong, had to take the door off. The hydraulic jack was bent, so I took it off found a fitting on a wrecked airplane and put the hydraulic lines together like this. Yeah, oh, no, I'm just a pilot, okay? <laughs> Filled it up with hydraulic fluid, took off, the gear handle wouldn't move. What I had done was butt 1,200 PSI against each other. <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't much response when you tried to move something. I got back to base, my maintenance officer said, what was your hydraulic pressure? I said, mm. he said, well, you do, you do know where the gauge is, don't you? <laughs> he said, it's, that th it's down there right between you on the lower panel. I said, oh, is that what that is? <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. Okay. Thank you so much.